And now let me introduce the speaker. Uh, John Randall is president of Zyvex, Zyvex Laboratories, as I mentioned, uh, where he works in nanofabrication technologies. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Texas, Dallas, and serves as the external engineering advisory board of that university. Before joining Zyvex, John was with Texas Instruments, where he was involved in the fabrication uh, of the first quantum dot diode, the first quantum uh, well bipolar transistor, the first working room temperature quantum integrated circuit, and the first lateral resonant tunneling diode. Prior to IT, uh, uh, to TI rather, uh, John worked at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory on ion beam and X-ray lithography. Uh, John, uh, John earned a bachelor's degree, a master's and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Houston. He's a senior member, he's a senior member of IEEE. He was also elected as a University of Houston Distinguished Engineering Alumnus, and he was designated as a distinguished member of the technical staff of, of Texas Instruments. Um, John is an author of over 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications, and his name appears at least 25 US patents. Besides his passion for nanotechnology, John has a lifelong affection for Belgian beer and uh, Belgian chocolate, which apparently he picked up when he was in Brussels or in Belgium working for IT. Uh, he's also playing uh, alto sax and designs and builds large format programmable inkjet painting robots for artists. Uh, John is happily married to his wife of many years, Patrice, and they live, uh, I presume you live in Dallas, yes, and they, he have two adult children, Ashley and Ian. And with this, please join me in welcoming John Randall to deliver his lecture on atom by atom manufacturing, making perfect materials and machines. John. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely pleased uh, to be here. Uh, especially in, in this excellent uh, venue, uh, the Cosmos Club, and uh, under the auspices of the, which I'm now a member of, I'm very proud of the Philosophical Society of Washington. Uh, before I get started on my talk, there's actually two people that I, oh, that's the wrong one. There's actually two people that I want to uh, thank. And the first is Larry Milstein, who, uh, invited me to come here and talk. And the second is Dean Collins, uh, my longtime friend and mentor uh, at uh, Texas Instruments and, El and beyond. Uh, and it's really, uh, Dean's had a huge impact on who I am and why I'm here today. And, and I want to thank him for that and thank Larry for inviting me here. Um, I also want to say that however much you're interested or repulsed by what I say tonight, these two gentlemen deserve credit or blame, uh, as you may take that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about has already been actually laid out. I forgot that uh, you had the, this idea of reading my abstract ahead of time, so some of my favorite punchlines are already gone. But uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, fabrication technology that will, in the words of Richard Feynman, literally put atoms where we want them. And taken to its logical extremes, this might ultimately end up something akin to a Star Trek replicator, where you might say, T, Earl Grey, hot, and have it something delivered very much what you want. But the technology I'm going to describe tonight is very much more limited than that. Uh, it, it, it's not sure how I'd make something that would make Earl Grey tea. But um, it has two very exciting attributes. The first of which is, I think that it can create things of significant value and large impact in the relatively near future. More than that, the second one is that I'm pretty sure I know how it would work and what it will take to build it. Okay, and so that's really what I want to convey to you tonight, or at least convince you that I think that this is possible. Um, I want to start off sort of justifying why we're doing this, and uh, I want to start off by asking a question, a sort of a curious question, what drives human technological progress? Now, again, my punchlines have largely been given away here, but l let me say that I've asked this question a number of times in public, and one time I did that, uh, one young lady held up her hand sort of timidly, and I called on her, and she said, greed and lust. 
Now, I don't want to argue with that answer. It's a perfectly good answer, but it's not what I was going for. In fact, um, uh, I want to start off my first of my, my three. Nobody would argue with. Certainly, human ingenuity is key to, to human technological progress. But in fact, it's not what limits human technological progress. Okay? Uh, we are extremely inventive. We invent things all the time that we can't realize. Uh, the other thing is materials, very important in a lot of cases for realizing things that have been invented. And the last of which you probably have guessed by now is manufacturing precision. Okay? Now those are not three that you'd probably come up with, but and uh, let me say that I, I would ask you to kindly suspend disbelief and let me make the case for why this is true. I want to go back and look at four inventions, okay? And there's lots of other examples that we could take, but I kind of like these four. The wheel, ball bearings, the steam engine, and uh, an automated computer, a computing machine. Now note the dates. This, to my best of ability looking back at, at good history sources, I believe this is when these were not only conceived of but the first working prototypes were realized at, at these times. And yet, it's not in these times that these inventions actually made major social and economic impacts. Um, it's at least hundreds, if not over a thousand years, before in the case of wheels on chariots, early Egyptian engineers, or in the case of um, ball bearings, French engineers and metallurgists. In the case of the steam engines, English blacksmiths. In the case of computers, American engineers had both the materials and the manufacturing precision to mass produce these things and make the major economic impacts that all of these things have had. So it's uh, actually more than just allowing new innovations to happen, but improved materials and improved manufacturing precision almost always take existing products and make them more reliable, more robust, more efficient, and in the long run, it also lowers manufacturing costs. Now, we've looked back pretty far in history. Let me move to just in the last hundred years. And let's ask ourselves, how did we go from, in 1910, the main trans there were cars around, there were automobiles around, but the main transportation was horse-drawn carriages. We had manually operated telephone exchanges. And the life expectancy in this country in 1910 was 50 years of age. Fast forward 100 years, now we're on the verge of space tourism. Everybody's got a GPS cell phone, and uh, the life expectancy is 80. Now, you got to be thinking to yourself, really? Manufacturing precision did all that? I claim that yes, every bit of this progress would be impossible without the vastly improved manufacturing precision. Really? Can it really make that much difference? After all, how much has manufacturing precision improved in the last hundred years? Who's willing to think it has improved by as much as a thousand? Let me see a show of hands. Do you think a thousand? How about ten thousand? In fact, if we go and look at, at Taniguchi's, Norio Taniguchi's chart, this is a subset of his data on the bleeding edge of extreme manufacturing. It's improved by almost a factor of 100,000 in the last 100 years. And the first 50 years of that actually uh, didn't even have anything to do with uh, electronics. The last 50 years of this ma improved manufacturing precision has allowed the information age to occur, radically change our life through a process that we of course know as Moore's Law, which really started in about 1960, shortly after Jack Kilby at TI invents the integrated circuit along with Robert Noyce. Um, and uh, it was actually the founder of Intel in 1965 that, that said, Gordon Moore, that said, you know, I've noticed that every 18 to 24 months we double the number of chips, uh, of, of, of in transistors that end up on chips. Well, this is marvelous. This is an exponential progression. It might go on for another 10 years. Now, a very curious thing's happened about predictions. People have been predicting the end of Moore's Law for a long time. And you know what the answer always is? 
10 years from whenever the question was asked. It always ends 10 years from now. They keep asking it, it always comes up with that answer. Okay, clever engineers have always beaten the, the experts uh, and figured out a way to make these things work. And so, so I've populated this with some of the amazing things that have happened uh, early on in, 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 uh, when we started on integrated circuits in the semiconductor pro process, nobody had any idea that, that video games, uh, uh, digital audio and video would, uh, would sh show up, um, that we'd have the internet. Uh, actually, uh, Jack Kilby, when asked shortly after he invents the integrated circuit, what did he think it would be good for? And he said, maybe for controlling washing machines. That's what he could come up with at the time. Um, now, here I want to stop and have you think a little bit about the amazing transformative effect of digital electronics on everybody's life. Okay? That's kind of obvious if you think about it. But why? How has this been possible? The reason it's been possible is because we can create information and control systems of enormous complexity and yet they operate outrageously reliably. That's allowed us to make these systems that can, you know, I can, uh, the, the most amazing thing that I've seen in, in recent years is when I got this iPhone, you can buy this little app called Shazam that can listen to a song for 10 seconds and tell you what it is, uh, who made it, what album it was on, and, and, and quickly offers to sell it to you for 99 cents. Uh, that's unbelievable to me, I mean, amazing. Now, the reason that this is possible, of course, is because of improved manufacturing precision. It's allowed us to make chips with more and more transistors. Now we have billions of transistors on a chip. And so we can make these very complex chips, but they have to operate extremely reliably for, in order for us to patch them together and to make these very complex systems that operate reliably. And part of it is that smaller devices turn out to be more reliable. That's counterintuitive. And I don't think we really entirely understand why, but this undoubtedly is happening, okay? But there is something that I do understand very well. We're using digital electronics, okay? You cannot do what we've done with digital electronics if electronics were still, still analog. The reason is because digital gives us some tolerance. The control voltage is probably less than a volt now, but let me say it's a volt. Anything above a half a volt is a one. It doesn't matter if it's 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or 0.9 volts. That's a one. Anything below a half a volt is a zero. It doesn't matter if it's 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. It, you've got this tolerance that the voltage can be somewhere in there. It's going to be a one or a zero. And so it makes air, you can always drive things back to the rail much closer to zero volts, much closer to one volts every once in a while. Error correction is easy to implement, so there's no accumulation of errors. So you get these outrageously reliable systems. You just can't do that with analog. That's a very important point. I want you to try to remember that one. I want to also come over back to another view of Moore's Law, and that's just the size, the, the technology nodes, the size of the minimum features on the transistors as a plotted as a function of time. Okay, and we're Currently, in the midst of heavy production of the 22 nanometer node, people are working hard on the 10 nanometer node, and this chart suggests they might get all the way out to the 4 nanometer node. Now, this raises an interesting question. I've been talking about precision. This is the minimum feature size. What sort of precision do I need to make these transistors work? Relatively, what's the control? Those of you that are not used to semiconductor manufacturing might be surprised by the answer. The relative precision required at any technological node is about plus and minus 5%. Now, at, say, 100 nanometers, plus and minus 5% is 5 nanometers. That's still a ridiculously small distance. But the relative precision, f plus and minus 5%, doesn't work in very many manufacturing. Who's done any carpentry, built any houses or apartments? Okay. Let's say, imagine yourself, you're building a house, and you're up on a roof. And you measure out, and you need a rafter that's 10 feet long. And you call down, Zeke, send me up a 10-foot rafter. And he sends you up a rafter that's 10 feet plus and minus 6 inches. Can you build a house that way? Not very well. Imagine trying to make an internal combustion engine when your tolerance is plus and minus 5%. Yet, they figured out because they're doing digital electronics, 
the clever engineers can get away with it. But even at plus and minus 5%, what that means is the, 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 the necessary tolerance down at, say, 4 nanometers, that's 0.4 nanometers. And plus and minus, that's like 0.2 nanometers. That's smaller than an atom. That's smaller than a silicon atom. That, all of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute. Let's go back to Taniguchi's chart for a second. If we, I'd taken the liberty of extrapolating his data out into this century, and he actually included atomic distance at 0.3 nanometers, okay? And if you extrapolate that out according to his sort of, extra, it would mean that atomic precision at the bleeding edge of manufacturing should be available, oh, about now. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, what does this mean? Uh, well, one of the things it means is we're running into the quantized nature of matter. Trust me, I've been, I worked at 15 years at Texas Instruments. Semiconductor processing, by and large, treats matter if it's, as if it's infinitely divisible. Okay, we ignore the fact that it's made up of atoms and molecules. We can, just whatever size we want, we can get it. They're running into that big time. So, the other thing is, and so, the quantized nature of matter is making improving precision more difficult, or at least it's complicating it. Um, another thing is, there's a lot less room at the bottom in 2013 than there was in 1959. What I'm trying to say is we improved manufacturing precision by about a factor of 100,000 in the last 100 years, and so we're down here somewhere I got news, there's not another five orders of magnitude improvement in manufacturing precision. So something's different here, okay? What's different is we have the opportunity now, I believe, to take advantage of the quantized nature of matter, and instead of fighting with trying to ever improving precision, let's just go for the whole enchilada, and let's go for absolute precision. I mean, making things where we're in control, we make two things, I want to use exactly the same number of atoms that I make th both things from, and I want to put those atoms in the same chemical bonding configuration. Now, a, s a slight difference in temperature, they're not exactly the same size, but, but they're exactly the same structure. And that's what I'm, when I say absolute precision, that's what I mean. Um, so, is that really possible? Is the where has the technology been that's, that's going to make that possible? And I go back to Feynman predicting back in 59 that he's not afraid to consider whether ultimately in the great future we can arrange atoms the way we want. Um, and so uh, a little while later, uh, some IBM guys, uh, Gerhard Benning and Heidi Rohr, uh, invent the scanning tunneling microscope. And I want to spend a second on the scanning tunneling microscope because that's going to be an important piece of equipment that we're going to deal with. It's actually a very simple piece of equipment. It's just a sharp tip that comes down close to a surface that's relatively flat. And we set a bias between the two, and we have a very, very uh, high-resolution instrument that can raise and lower that tip. And we put a bias between it, and then we get down close enough that electrons can tunnel from the tip to the sample or from the sample to the tip. And that's a very, very, that tunneling current is very, very sensitive to that distance. So we throw in a feedback loop that raises and lowers the tip until they get to a, a current that we've selected, a set point current, that might be, let's say, 100 picoamps. Then we use the other part of the actuators to scan the thing laterally across the surface with the feedback loop on, so it goes up and down as it sees the contours of the surface, and if it's a sharp tip where most of that tunneling is coming from a single spot, a single atom, you can actually image the atoms. This is a very early ver uh, uh, image of gold atoms on a 111 gold surface where you can see the individual atoms. That's a scanning tunneling microscope. Okay, now, this is used mainly by researchers to, to do imaging uh, of surfaces. We want to use it for a different purpose, uh, and we'll talk about that. Also in 1986, in, in addition to the Nobel Prize for the STM, Eric Drexler published his book, about the engine of creation, the coming era of nanotechnology. Now, he said, geez, if we can arrange atoms any way we want, we can make some cool stuff. And, I, and this and other things, Eric and other people 
went about and they didn't worry about how they put them together. They said, but if we could put these together, we can make these gears and, and they could, and people have shown that these structures are stable and that they would operate with very low friction and minus anything else coming in, they wouldn't wear out and lots of other cool stuff. And this excited a lot of people. What could we do? But the problem was that nobody really knew how to create these things. Uh, but then a little while later, somebody gave a hint Another IBM guy named Don Eigler, who, uh, aside from being a superb scientist, gets my prize for, for the last two centuries' best marketing scientist on the planet. He did not make a square. He didn't make a rectangle. He nudged a bunch of, at, at very low temperatures, xenon atoms around on a copper surface until he lined up to spell out his company's logo which made IBM more than happy to spread that image all over the world, making Don the IBM god that he remains today. Brilliant marketing. But he's demonstrated our dominion over matter in terms of putting atoms where we want them. Much more recently, some other very interesting technology came along, and that is DNA origami. Uh, uh, Paul Rothman uh, and some other people have developed this where using very straightforward chemistry and the fact that you can get DNA designed the way you want it to, it self-assembles into two and three dimensional structures. D getting really atomic precision, at least on a relative sense, uh, and this is fantastic. Uh, and and uh, I wouldn't call this manufacturing, and I certainly wouldn't call Don's approach manufacturing, but the technology that makes this possible, the synthetic synthesis of DNA, is atomically precise manufacturing. Okay, they put the atoms where they want to. Now it's pretty limited. It can only make strands of DNA, but that's a hell of a thing to make. The impact to health sciences and life sciences has just been amazing. Okay, but still, since you can make three-dimensional structures with atomic precision, there are some very uh, brave souls, uh, Eric Winfrey, Ned Siemens, Paul Rothman, that are trying to make non-biological uses of this and by God they should and it's great and I think it's wonderful but ladies and gentlemen I am a brute force engineer okay I want to make something out of something where I'm not counting on self-assembly I want something where I've got top-down control I don't want to make stuff out of covalently bonded solids that won't fall apart when I put them in boiling water I want to make things that, that I can design maybe out of a few just a few materials and I can put atoms where I want them with a very robust process okay but who am I to say that all that's possible? Let me take a second or two and try to justify uh, my and my company's qualifications and why I might be able to say something reasonable about this. Uh, one of the things is that, um, what's Zyvex, okay? Most of you probably not have heard of Zyvex. Um, uh, Zyvex was founded by Jim Bonier, a guy that made a lot of money in a previous software company back in 1997. Uh, and I joined in 2001. We developed some valuable uh, technology, split the company up. April Fool's Day of 2007, we split the company up into uh, Zyvex Instruments, which became acquired by DCG Systems, Zyvex Technologies. Jim recently has formed Zycraft uh, to take advantage of the things Zyvex Technologies make. And uh, Zyvex Labs is, is who I represent, and we're working on this atomically precise manufacturing. And although I don't have time to talk about it, we are literally working to heal the blind. Uh, and if you want to talk to me about that afterwards, I'll tell you a little bit about that. It's a very exciting technology. It doesn't have much to do with the atomic precise stuff, but it's a very cool technology. Now, what I want to, main thing I want to get across to you about Zyvex is we have a history of successful commercialization of nanotech. And we've often done it, thank you very much, uh, federal agencies, with support of research contract dollars from the federal government, particularly uh, DARPA, NASA, and NIST. Uh, and so Zyvex Technologies makes, is the world's leading supplier of carbon nanotube polymer composites. They are producing some spectacular materials. Composites that sort of plateaued. They get 40% improvement in tensile strength and toughness at the, no, 40% improvement in compressive strength, about 10, 20% improvement in tensile strength, and a 40% improvement in toughness at the same time. That is remarkable. They were making, they're making big boats. I think they've been qualified to make GE's, the cowlings on GE's new jet engines. Um, Zyvex Instruments is, is made with especially NIST ATP support, uh, nanoprobing tools that are used by every major uh, semiconductor manufacturer worldwide. 
And through a great program at MTO, we're working on atomically precise manufacturing, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. But first, I really want to say that we got this huge boost from DARPA. Start off with Tom Kenny, a Stanford prof that was a, a DARPA program manager, then Tai and one day, an MIT prof that was a program manager, ended up with finishing up under Andre Shakel, but also had support from the great state of Texas. And we had a spectacular team working on this, it included leading universities, uh, a lot of great industry help. Uh, NIST uh, certainly played a very significant role. And we had some very important international collaborators. And we formed the, inter the Atomically Precise Manufacturing Consortium. And we're always looking to add new members. I got a spot for your institution and your name here. See me after the talk. Um, I also, that ended up in March of this year. We've just started a few weeks ago a new program under the Army Research Office to work on making quantum computers. I'll tell you more about that later, but we're using very similar technology. Well, now, if I'm sitting in the audience, if I'd never gone to Zyvex Labs, if I'd stayed at TI or something, and I was sitting in the audience right now, I'd be thinking, okay, when is this joker going to get around to telling me what he can make and how he's going to make it? Okay, so let me try to justify that. Actually, what I want to do is I'm going to show you a video, and I'm going to show it twice. And I like the sound effects so much on the, vid on the video. Uh, I'm going to play it through once. I'm not going to say anything. show this to you again, but this time I'm going to talk over all the cool effects. The first of all, we're going to show you that covalently bonded solids like to have all their chemical bonds satisfied. This is a, a very simplified crystal structure. Uh, we're working in silicon, and that's not the silicon crystal structure, but all the covalent bonds are satisfied except at the surface. And they're very active, but we can passivate those chemical bonds with something like hydrogen, and then we can look at them with an STM without disturbing the hydrogen. But then we can also raise the voltage or current and break those silicon hydrogen bonds. And if we do it right, we can remove exactly the, the hydrogen atoms we want. We bring in a precursor gas that contains hydrogen and silicon. It self-limits in its deposition. We pattern again. We send in more gas. And we repeat that structure. And if we do that accurately enough, then we can control where every single stinking atom goes. Okay, so that's the approach, the technical approach we're taking to try to get to what I mean by absolute precision. Now, we haven't fully realized that yet, but we have demonstrated the basic process works, and I'll show you some of that later. But first, I want to show you our laboratories in uh, the Dallas, Texas area. We've got a couple of ultra-high vacuum scanning tunneling microscopes. Here's a lab in proof that we're also working on cloning, because James Owen is in that picture twice. Um, uh, we didn't go out and buy a scanning tunneling microscope from Omicron or RHK. There's very good suppliers of commercial STMs, but they are general purpose imaging tools and analyzing tools. We want to build a manufacturing tool. We actually want to build a patterning tool that will remove exactly the hydrogen atoms that we want. And so we built our own system. We use a Joe Lighting style scanner. Jim's a software guy. We hired a, a, literally a string theorist to help out with the software as well, a guy named Udi Fuchs who's also a great uh, uh, software guy. But this way, we're not beholding to anybody's proprietary hardware or software. We can do whatever we want. Now, I'm going to make a real brief reference to the fact that this technology, this hydrogen depassivation lithography, this removing of hydrogen atoms, is actually a form of E-beam lithography. And there's a fascinating discussion about how this is very much like conventional E-beam lithography and yet very different from it. And uh, I don't want to go into that. I really don't have time, if it, and there are some e-beam lithography experts in the audience. 
uh, that we could talk about this, but I'm going to push forward and tell you a little bit more about the, the, the actual process. First of all, we're working on a silicon 100 surface. Okay, and that has some huge advantages. First of all, this is the most studied surface in the world by a large margin, and we know a lot about it. One of the things that silicon likes to do on 100 surface, it normally, if you cleave through a, a silicon crystal and get the 100 surface, there'd be even spacing of those atoms. But to minimize surface energy, they tend to lean in and make these dimer rows, two atoms close together. Th those things are at a pitch of 0.768, less than a nanometer. And so the width of the line is really less than a nanometer, and the pitch is, is less than a nanometer. And, and it's, it's, uh, crystal has, uh, the crystal structure of silicon is the same as that of diamond, and because of that, these dimer rows, every time you go up and down a, uh, an atomic's edge, the direction of those changed by 90 degrees. So this is a beautiful STM image. You see a few vacancies, the dark areas, uh, the, the, the lines that you can see are pairs of rows of pairs of silicon atoms. You can see a couple of light spots there. That's actually where there's missing hydrogen atoms. Otherwise, that's hydrogen passivated. This allows me to, to make the point when you're looking at these STM images, where we remove the hydrogen, notice the little black dots are hydrogen here, they're missing there. Where we remove it, it looks much lighter. It's sort of counterintuitive because something brighter would mean that it was taller in spite of the fact we removed a layer. The reason is these are unsatisfied covalent bonds. They're unfilled covalent bonds. It's easier to tunnel into them, so the tunneling current goes up and the tip retracts a little bit. Uh, just a point to, to help understand. Now, we could, so I'm using this crystal surface as a guide for my patterning. This is actually my address grid, okay? And I've, we've decided we could use every individual atom as a pixel. We decided for various reasons to, to include four silicon surface atoms with four hydrogen atoms on them as a pixel. It's a 0.768 nanometer pixel. Uh, and we can actually image and do Fourier transform analysis and, and out of that information, we can identify the little green crosses every, or at the corners of the pixels on the surface here. Okay, so we can identify where the pixels are. We can see if there's hydrogen there or not. And then the process of lithography falls into two very different regimes. There's the first atomic precision or low bias. And when I say low bias, uh, we're two to five volts, where we're in the tunneling regime where you normally are, say, for imaging, but we raise the current up enough that we can break the silicon hydrogen bond. Okay, we can, we can target a specific silicon hydrogen bond and pop the hydrogen off. Now, and so up here where you see the little bright dots up there, that's where Joe Lighting picked off individual hydrogen atoms. Now that's really not the mode we want to operate in. It's not usually all that useful to create isolated dangling bonds. So we can make perfect rectangles or squares or a variety of deals. That's actually perfect ones are hard to do. What we Actually, the main mode we're going for is we run the tip along a dimer row and knock off the two hydrogen atoms along that dimer row. So that's a sub-nanometer line that we've patterned. There's no other lithography process that I know of that gets sub-nanometer resolution. There's a very different mode at high, higher biases, high uh, being uh, sort of 8 volts and up, where you're in a field emission mode and you have a much more efficient process of, of breaking chemical bonds. It's actually uh, uh, about two orders of magnitude up at 10 volts, and then we started playing up at higher voltages, uh, and so we can get another couple of orders of magnitude. We have much more efficient removal. It's a single electron process in this case instead of a multi-electron process, but it's a sloppier process. We get a region that's, that's, that's fully exposed, but we also get a region of width that's partially exposed. We remove part, part of the hydrogen atoms, but we can make good use of that. Uh, now, since we can start, and all of this, frankly, is automated, so Udi's created um, uh, a little function called David Star, and 16 says how many pixels he wants it to be wide, and so you can see again the green squares that identify the pixels and then if you can look the black and the red meanders are where we've decided to do the exposure and here's on a different piece of silicon and actually slightly larger is a six-pointed star. Uh, so we can combine these two high resolution mode uh, and, and Ballard mode, much more efficient and take a page out of the standard e-beam lithography uh, playbook 
and realize it's actually not that different than machining, okay? I, for those of you that have done either, either any mill work uh, or even uh, woodwork, you start off with a coarse sandpaper to remove a lot of wood, then you get down to fine sandpaper to get things polished. So we use the big bit, which is the high, which is the high voltage field emission regime to hog out the big areas, then clean up the edges and the fine parts with, with the fine part. And by doing that too, we can dramatically improve the speed. It's still slow, but we can dramatically improve the speed. And we've started doing that. We still have some, a few, a little bit of alignment or control issues, but we're starting to do the interior with the, with the higher voltage and the exterior lines with uh, the lower voltage. So here's the outside edge, the inside edge, and the two of them combined. And that's, uh, again, it's beginning to be automated. Uh, we're successful of doing some in small areas where we define, actually we'll, we can expose an area and that can be a, a, an alignment marker, a part of our fiducial that we align to. And we can say we want to make these sort of uh, rectangles and then we can come pretty close to defining those. That's getting better. We're slowly expanding the area over which we can do that. Uh, and uh, we also, instead of, you know, if we want to do a rectangle or a six-pointed star, we already have functions to do that, but we want to do arbitrary patterns. So we can, st we can actually take a bitmap for each pixel is defined to be a 0 0.768 nanometer part and run it through a vector generator and uh, it passes off the vectors to the machine and it goes and draws out the very important Hello Kitty pattern. Uh, so we can make Hello Kitty. We can do actually uh, a wide variety of things. We can make a, a, another open six-pointed star. We can make political cartoons. We can do our company logo. That's actually a, a picture of uh, Josh Ballard's wife. You can see the eyes, her nose, chin. Uh, she loved it. Um, uh, and we can also make some useful patterns, okay, that we use in experiments. Um, now, here's where I want to make what I think is an extremely important point. I talked about how important digital was. This is a digital fabrication process. First of all, the resist response is digital. There's no way to partially break a silicon hydrogen bond. That hydrogen's either there or it's gone. My address grid is laterally quantized, which is the silicon lattice. I can read the state of that address grid without disturbing the pattern. And not only that, there's tolerance to my tip position. These are supposed to be three dimer rows of silicon. There's the silicon, there's the little black dots of the, of the hydrogen. Um, and it turns out there's a tolerance of about 0.3 nanometers. It's not a large distance, but it's a distance we can work with that as long as I'm sending the tip inside that rectangle along that line, I can remove both hydrogen atoms. So if I'm right within that rectangle, I get both hydrogen atoms off. If I'm a little bit outside it, I might only get a single row of atoms, which I don't want to do. I want to remove both of them. Uh, and even we've seen in a few cases, it's sort of interesting, if we're right in the middle of them, we can send that tip down with the same current and the same voltage. We don't remove any hydrogen atoms. That's a pretty tight area to do that. It's a curious thing. The point is that we can do close to perfect or, or perfect without perfect tip positioning. There's a tolerance. Here's another uh, sort of example of that, but also an example of a, a lithography that no other technology that I know of can do. These are three nanometer squares. And they're really squares. I mean, we got sharp corners. You can't do that with any other t patterning technology, trust me. And the fact is, this isn't perfect. We're sort of missing by, this is what I'd call it atomically precise. We're accurate to win sort of one atom spacing. On the average, we're actually much better than that. And I know that our tip positioning is actually worse than 0.15 nanometer, nanometers. Otherwise, we'd have perfect patterns. So this tolerance and tip positioning is, is a hallmark of a digital process. Um, well, so what? I can make great patterns in a monolayer of hydrogen. What am I going to do with that? Okay, this technology has been around for a couple of decades, and nobody's done anything useful with it yet. So what makes me think that we can do something particularly useful? Well, I'm going to point out several things that are already being done, uh, or certainly could be done, that I think are very useful. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we're going to actually do them. One of the most dramatic things that really has happened recently is a woman named Michelle Simmons. She's an English woman that's in Australia. 
working at the in, uh, University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. She's making remarkable structures, which this, this is from one of her publications called a single atom transistor. It's really not a single atom transistor, but she put a single at phosphorus dopant atom to contribute an electron to the conduction channel. But that little pink bump in the middle is actually where a silicon atom has been ejected and a phosphorus atom has gone into the silicon lattice. And she does this with the same hydrogen depassivation lithography. And this is a remarkable thing because she's using it to try to make quantum computing devices. Now, I don't want to, quantum computing is very confusing. It's confusing to me. I just, I went a week long seminar about it and I learned some things and mainly what I learned is I'm more confused than ever. But what it is good, it's, it will not replace conventional computing. But there's a small subset of algorithms that it does way better than classical computers can do. And those are important algorithms. Especially they're really good at encryption and decryption. And that's why the NSA and the CIA and the FBI are very, very keenly interested. And that's why ARO gave us money to work on trying to make this style of quantum computer that Michelle Simmons is working on. They're actually funding her. That's how good she is. Our DOD is sending her money in Australia. But they would like to catch up people onshore, and so they're giving money to us and to Sandia to work on that. But she's done something else that's really, to me, really, really remarkable. Okay, she's made a transistor that's very, very different than any other kind of transistor that's ever been made before. Okay? The world has been running for the last several decades on metal oxide semiconductor transistors. We had NMOS transistors, then we had PMOS transistors, now we have CMOS complementary metal. All the action in the control of the electrons happens at the surface of the silicon uh, where you've got a little oxide layer and then a metal gate above it. Okay? She's made something that's way, way different. Action's going on inside the bulk of the silicon. And in fact, you could argue phosphorus is only one atomic number different than silicon. You could argue this is, a, this is a, a device without any material interfaces. That's a lot different. Now, it will have some serious limitations. But we held a workshop at NIST about a year and a half ago suggesting there are a lot of exciting possibilities of this entirely new device uh, regime, and, and uh, I hope to work on that. Let me take another much simpler to explain example. A wall of silicon, a known number of atom wide, wide and tall, is a metrology standard. I've been telling you how important manufacturing precision is. If you don't have metrology standards, you can't do high precision manufacturing. So we believe that we know how to make this. Um, it's going to take some time to get there to do it where it's absolutely precise, but we, can, uh, we think the cost of doing that is going to be well under $1,000, and we can sell it to VLSI standard, who will sell it for several tens of thousands of dollars, plenty of margins for both of us. Um, here's a real both a good and a bad example, but a very high impact area. The, the area of DNA sequencing is very, very hot, and there's lots and lots of technologies. If you, Larry will tell you more than you want to know about sequencing DNA. But one of the very attractive approaches that a lot of people are working on is the so-called DNA nanopore, where the idea is you make an opening about two to four nanometers, and you send a strand of DNA through, and you read the bases as it goes through. And here's a classic example of where you need the precision. People can make the openings the size they want them. They just can't make them with enough precision. They can't control the size and the shape well enough to get regular translocation of that DNA up through there. They also are having a hard time figuring out how to get the electrodes in there. I think I know how to do both. Um, uh, there are many, many other nanobio uses, ultra-precise filters, uh, maybe uh, designed enzymes, uh, there's lots of stuff. Um, I don't have time to uh, talk about it in any great detail. Uh, uh, I mentioned, um, oh, come on, move for me. There we go. I mentioned um, MIMS, microelectrical mechanical devices, is one of the real offshoots of semiconductor processing that's been very, very successful. But remember how I talked about, MIMS are mechanical devices. Remember how I talked about the plus and minus 5%? MIMS can make spectacular resonators. Resonators are really, really useful for a lot of things, making filters, uh, running, controlling the clock speed on your uh, uh, computer. Um, but the problem is, with plus and minus 5%, to first order, the control of the frequency of your oscillator is controlled by the size. 
So if you don't have but plus and minus 5% control of the center frequency, you've got a problem. Okay? People are finding ways around it. But if we can make much better precision and much smaller, we can get higher, we believe, higher cues, better control of operating frequency, and uh, uh, better uh, devices that way. Uh, another thing that we could do that's of extreme value, now this, I haven't beat on this too hard, but my process is a very, very low throughput process. It's never going to be able to do consumer electronics. Just not going to happen. But nano imprint is a really effective, high resolution way, it's just molding, of, of making patterns. Just molding. Okay? But you've got to make a mold that's accurate. I think I can make really, really precise molds and then m very much more cost effectively than a tip based approach. You can stamp these out quickly. This may or may not end up doing consumer electronics, but there's a lot of valuable things that it could do. Um, now, so how does this work? I've already really told you. When we remove hydrogen atoms, we've got unsatisfied covalent bonds. Where we keep hydrogen atoms, you have a relatively inert surface. There's lots of stuff that will stick to that. And as we're operating in a UHV environment, ultra-high vacuum environment, we can control what gets to that surface. And so we can put what we want. Uh, there's really three ways we're trying to do that. There's other ways we could. But three things, this 3D atomic precision, 3D printing, remember the video I showed? We remove hydrogen atoms, we get silicon atoms to stick down. Now in that case, we have to keep removing the hydrogen atoms, have to pattern a lot to build up the structure. But we can also uh, do, and we've made some progress on that. Uh, here's where we, this, this area, we've removed hydrogen atoms. You can see a few atomic edge steps. Then we've dosed with disilane. We've done the patterning again, dosed again a couple of times. You see the stripes this way and then this way? That means we're adding silicon that's going down in registry with, this, with the silicon. So we're adding to the crystal structure. Um, Here's an example of about 20 monolayers of silicon that we've added uh, overnight. It's not atomically precise, and the, the growth is a little bit rough, but it shows that the basic selective deposition process works. Uh, now, we can also, we already mentioned that uh, Michelle Simmons has shown you can put silicon atoms where she wants, uh, phosphorus atoms where she wants them in silicon. The way she does it, she removes the hydrogen atoms. She doses with phosphine instead of disilane. Don't try this at home. Phosphine's a deadly poisonous gas, okay, but you, you can protect yourself. Uh, and uh, then she very carefully grows silicon on top of it using standard silicon molecular beam epitaxy. So she can put phosphorus atoms where she wants them in silicon and build up these quantum computing and other potentially interesting devices. Um, then finally, we can actually make hard masks. We can deposit stuff. The hydrogen won't stop any kind of an edge. We put hydrogen there, we, mostly time, like e-beam lithography, you do your pattern and you use that resist to, as a block to etch silicon. Uh, we can use another process. We've, we're actually, we're trying two things. We're trying to oxidize the silicon where we remove the hydrogen, and we're sort of oxidizing it, but it's not standing up. It's not a good etch mask. But we found working with people at, at UT Dallas that we can actually do atomic layer deposit deposition, which is a cyclic chemical vapor deposition. We actually send in pulses of water and pulses of uh, titanium tetrachloride, and we can build up titanium dioxide, which turns out to be a decent, not a great, but a decent reactive ion etching mask. So here's some quick examples of what we've done. The, uh, we, up here is the STM pattern. Uh, there are about 20 nanometer lines. Here's where we've deposited AFM data after we've deposited the, AL, the uh, titanium dioxide. Uh, then here's after we've etched down into it. Uh, so we've made uh, not very deep into there. Uh, we've done some smaller structures. Here's 10 nanometer lines that are produced in the very same way. Now, so once we can make mask and etch, this is much more like traditional semiconductor processing. So if we want to make things like MIMS or NIMS, we, put, we do the patterning, we put the hard mask where we want them. If you want to make MIMS, often you do it on top of silicon on insulator. So there's silicon, the dark gray, the black is the, the hard mask, the, the, the dark gray is the silicon, the light gray or light blue in there is actually an oxide layer. So we can do reactive ion etching to etch down through the silicon. Then we can do a release step, vapor or liquid HF, to etch out the uh, 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 oxide. And we can get both anchored and free pieces of silicon. That's the way they make MIMS. So we can do this sort of standard processing stuff now. We can do the same thing to make nanoimprint templates. 
And here's a nano imprint template that we've made for SV Srinivasan at UT Austin, one of the founders of molecular imprints, the leading uh, nano imprint company. And he wanted this for a specific reason. Um, your hard disks, I, I went into a Best Buy the other day. I can buy a terabyte external drive for $70. But they're coming to the end of what they can do on uniform magnetic films. They put a, a nice uniform film. There's limits to the way they can magnetize it. So what they want to go to is bit pattern media where they don't put a, a continuous film but little dots of magnetic material. Then they're going to magnetize in one direction or another. But SV is, uh, he's more ambitious. Remember that six-pointed star? We started off talking to him. He wants to store multiple bits in a single patch of magnetic material. And the idea on the six-pointed star is there's three different magnetic vectors that you could store one direction or another, so you could store then one, more than one bit of information. Now, it turns out that they did some more simulations. They found that at room temperature, that that would probably move around. It wouldn't be stable enough. So they switched religions. They went from a Star of David to a cross. And it turns out in the cross that it is stable. They can store the uh, data one direction or the other, one, uh, or in one leg or the other. Uh, and this is a, 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 a nano imprint template that should print. It's there at uh, UT Austin. Uh, th there's some ancillary stuff. There's, if there's a micron sized particle somewhere else in our sample, that won't be the, our, our thing won't be the tallest thing. So they haven't actually successfully printed one yet, but that's coming soon, I'm sure. The last thing I want to show you that we've made is uh, uh, we're get, starting to get better. We've already done much better lithography than we've done making hard masks, and we're starting to head in this direction. Uh, this is a set of lines that are actually on a 16 dimer row pitch, which is about 12.3 nanometers. And here's after we've done the uh, ALD and, and reactive ion etching. The reactive ion etching, I believe, was done at NIST. Uh, and we've removed 20 or 30 nanometers. And uh, although the size of those aren't perfect, the pitch is. We know because we've, we, we formed it on these, these dimer rows. So this is, uh, and you could average over them, and you get a very, very, very good pitch metrology. And there's lots of other things we can do there. Okay, so I'm about out of time. What's my strategy? We figured out these different ways to make these very small, very precise things. They're not quite absolutely precise yet, but they're atomically precise. I think there's lots of cool stuff that we can do. We can make NIMS, we can make nanopores for DNA sequencing, lots of other cool stuff. So we're going to go out and, and really exploit that and make a lot of money. Yes and no, we're going to do that for sure, but we're also going to work very hard at getting to absolute precision. Now why are we going to spend all this time and effort? That's going to be expensive, it's going to be hard. Why would we want to do that when we can just exploit this? I'll tell you why. Uh, well, I, the why is because Jim Von Ayer and I are, we want to go for the big enchilada. Uh, we want to go for the crown jewel of nanotechnology. Again, I want absolute precision. I want every atom where I want it to go. And let me tell you why. Um, if we can do absolute precision, then everything is exactly the same size. We have now what I call digital matter. Um, then we could take these absolute precise components and assemble them with no error accumulation. We could make much larger structures with no error accumulation. We could make materials potentially that are either defect free or engineered to be very defect tolerant. All macro scale materials fail at defects. If you could make a bar of iron with no defects in it, it would be way stronger than a bar of iron now is because they got all these grain boundaries and defects where cracks propagate. You could, you could engineer something where that didn't happen or eliminate all the defects. Now, what I'm going to suggest, the reason that we want to do this, is I think you can make a new exponential trend. And I want to compare and contrast that with Moore's Law. Moore's Law is about downscaling, making things smaller, and maintaining this plus and minus 5% relative precision, which means that manufacturing precision has to improve to get smaller and maintain that relative precision. But the product, chips started off small and got up uh, in a few decades to about 25 by 36 millimeters, and they've stayed there the chips aren't getting any bigger. That's the size chip you get. So the size of the product is consistent, but you get an exponential growth of product complexity because you can put more and more transistors on the chip. Okay, that's Moore's law. I'm suggesting there's another potential exponential trend where we achieve absolute precision and then scale up. 
we make larger and larger products um, that maintain that absolute precision. So the product size and complexity can grow. So you'll, get an ex you'll also get an exponential growth in the range of products. So I think you can get this. Well, first I want to answer, make a quick point about who's going to do this. And you would think it would be the semiconductor companies because they're really best positioned to do this. But they are not going to do it for two main reasons. One of which is they're going to fight tooth and nail not to do it as well they should. They figured out a way to live with plus and minus 5% precision. So they're making digital devices. It's going to be more expensive in the short run to make, atomically to make absolutely precise devices. So they're going to avoid it. Also, the initial markets were going to be tiny compared to what the semiconductor industry wants to do. It, they're not going to be economically motivated to try to do this. So who's going to do it? My money's on Zyvex Labs. Um, so I think some sort of exponential trend can happen where we first figure out how to make atomically precise something, let's say it's a micron cubed. Now a micron cubed is a tiny mi microscopic amount of material, okay? But a lot of these things I've talked about can be made with a, uh, less than a square micron of atomically precise material. And then I think some sort of growth trend is going to happen, more money is going to come back in, and we're going to go up this scale at some rate. I don't know for sure. That's a spitball guess of what. But already we have identified that, that this can be very valuable because we can, uh, this is really beating a dead horse, with absolute precision, no error accumulation, much better reliability and predictability interactions, far more complex systems that operate reliably, potentially defect-free or defect-tolerant materials, and much more, here's the key, much more effect, effective, efficient digital manufacturing, which allows us to do this exponential growth. So we've identified already a number of, of products that we can make that take a very tiny amount of atomic precision uh, that are less than a, usually less than a square micro, a cubic micron. We think this can build up, and we're very excited about it. So uh, I'm right at the limit of my time, so I want to end with this thought. If in the last hundred years we made the spectacular progress we did, if we can really make atomic, absolutely precise manufacturing possible, digital matter, and we get on this new exponential growth trend, what, what can we do in terms of life expectancy, transportation, and communications? It will be really hard to imagine where we could go with it. With that, I think I want to leave you with a thank you and be happy to entertain questions at this point in time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two microphones. Uh, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, when you get the microphone, stand up, r state your name, and whether you're a member of the society or not. Let's start here at the front. Oh. Thank you. I've, been, I've enjoyed this. Oh. But I want to talk oh, about. Can you state your name? Oh, and my name is Rudy Krutar. I am a member of the society. Sorry that I failed to say that. But I want to talk about a speech given at the 50th anniversary of the Association for Computing Machinery that claimed that Moore's Law was not a law. The speaker was Gordon Moore. <laughs> so he, had, he knew something about it. And he said that when he came up with Moore's Law, I think in 1963, he had only three data points. And it's very hard to, you can extrapolate almost anything from three data points. He said that what happened was that the industry adopted it as, as its roadmap, and so it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. My question is, with your, can, you get, can you get the industry to adopt this law as its roadmap, or are you saying that they, they won't do it? Um, if, and you're absolutely right, it is totally self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, and it's not a law. And actually, he didn't say anything about downscaling. He just said that the number of transistors would double every so often. Uh, there's lots of other things that have been... He lost control of that a long time ago. <laughs> um, uh, but I told... There's lots of other examples of exponential growth uh, of, uh, of products. Uh, somebody showed me the cost of chickens has had a long-term exponential decline in cost. Now, it's been a much slower pace... But there's lots of other examples of where something catches on and you get this sort of exponential trend. And it becomes something that people start tracking and it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, our, I totally believe this fortuitous circle 
at whatever rate that it goes, of, that happened with semiconductors, that um, you make something that's valuable, that people can use, and they figure out new things that you never imagined to do with it, and, and that brings more money back in. And, and trust me, semiconductor manufacturing and semi you could not make today's semiconductor tools without using the semiconductor manufacturing of a year or two ago. The, uh, it feeds on itself. I totally believe that this sort of thing is possible. Now, what exponential trend we're going to follow, that's anybody's game. I have n imaginary data points that, that I extrapolated this from. Okay, so I, I'm not saying that I know exactly where this is going to go, but I'm totally convinced this sort of process will play itself out, and I'm totally convinced absolute precision manufacturing at will happen and will happen much sooner than most people think because the technological underpinnings are already there. We just have to have the will and have the vision to see it happen. That's okay. I'll wait for I mean, absolute precision is a... Oh, Al, state your name, please. <clears throat> My name is <clears throat> Al Ehrlich. I'm a member of the Society. Um, absolute precision is a, a bold statement. Have you considered the limitations of maximizing entropy? I mean, you, you can't grow the perfect single crystal in, just in principle because entropy demands to be a certain number of yeah, but I'm gonna, imperfections. I'm going to take it out of the hands of entropy. <laughs> I, I'm going to force the atoms to go where I want them to. How will you keep them there? Um, now, there... There, there is a case to be made that it's absolutely true. I don't, I, I don't know if, it, if cosmic rays fit into entropy, but you make a perfect crystal, you're going to get some cosmic rays that come in and do some damage and create some, and create some defects. That's going to happen. And if you strictly leave it up to thermodynamics, uh, uh, you, you won't grow a perfect crystal. Right. I completely agree. But if you have enough controls, I think you can force the atoms into the position that you want them in. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be absolutely perfect. And, and Larry and I had an interesting discussion about this last night in between two bottles of wine. Um, and I agree that, that perfection is something to strive for, but you don't necessarily have to get there to get huge value because you can live with certain defects. I agree with that, but absolute precision, I think, is thermodynamically not possible, but that's a separate issue. Okay. First, what's the difference oh, between state your name, please. Oh, David you. Rosen? What's the difference between absolute uh, precision and perfect precision, as you brought it up? And second of all, uh, uh, aren't there limitations on, on time precision? Aren't there other precision uh, things involved? Uh, perfect again. We've got problems with the vernacular here. And even when I say absolute precision, that's probably not the best term to use. Uh, but I do believe that we can come up with things that do, uh, with a reasonably high yield, put the atoms where you want them in the configurations that you want them. Okay? Uh, Don Eigler did that with a very, at very low temperatures, nudging xenon atoms around and, and put those 35 xenon atoms exactly where he wanted and they're stable for a long period of time. I realize that they're not chemically bonded very well, but uh, with top-down control, I really think that you can create things that are in, uh, over a small area, inv structurally invariant, maybe is a term I could use. Well, well no, but no, I, th I think these, you make, covalent bonds are not easy to move around. Okay, you have to pay attention to what's going on at the surface. We took, for instance, one of the things we did before we did, did any of this is we did the best, is a while ago, uh, but we did the best D DFT first principles uh, calculations of would a cube of silicon, one nanometer in size, would that be stable? And what we found, we, we just cleaved the thing. What we found is you got the, you got the, the uh, two by one reconstruction that you normally expect to get on a one OO surface and it was stable. We tried to make things a little bit smaller and surface tensions overcame them and, and they fell apart. As far as the common uh, entropy is concerned, uh, you 
Fair enough. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Dave Rubinowitz. I am a member. Uh, this is a strictly technical, probably irrelevant question, but in your STM, uh, when you're scanning, do you move the sample or the head or both? Uh, currently, we're, we're moving the tip and not the sample. Um, uh, in the long run, I'd rather move the tip. And in the long run, I expect to not use a standard piezo tube. We want to use MEMS uh, uh, positioners. And if you're moving the tip instead of the sample, you're moving less mass, and so you can move it faster, and we think control it better. Uh, so I, th I think it's unlikely we're going to move the sample. We're going to be moving the tip. That's a very relevant question. I think Dean had his hand up. I'm Dean Collins. I'm a guest here tonight. John, you seem to be uh, doing what I would call a bottoms-up approach, and 3D printing is sort of a tops-down approach. Would you like to make any comments about where the two technologies may meet? Uh, um, again, it depends on what you, people think of. Oh, if you're dealing with, with chemical bonds, it must be bottom-up. I view this as strictly a top-down approach. The only thing I'm doing in, in the th sort of the 3D printing where we're trying to grow silicon is I'm relying on uh, epitaxy, essentially. And if epitaxy is a bottom-up approach, okay, fine. I'm relying on, on the self-assembly of the silicon, uh, the, the disilane coming in to arrange itself into the uh, silicon crystal. Uh, but I I'm controlling where that happens, okay? So I think of it much more as a top-down approach. Uh, you could argue it either way. I, I, I trust self-assembly to do simple things, and epitaxy is a simple thing that self-assembly can do very well. I don't so much trust self-assembly to do more complex things. With self-assembly, you're always driving towards, with most bottom-up self-assembly approaches, you're always driving towards a minimum energy configuration. And often what you'd like to have is not in a minimum energy configuration. Uh, effectively, what we're doing, you could conceive of as templated self-assembly, and so it's a combination of bottom-up and top-down. I think of it much more as top-down, but I think it's sort of semantics to some extent. But the way Dean, I guess Dean was your mentor at TI? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for joining us this evening. Next, uh, Lloyd. Patrick Alsop, I'm a... Uh, um, I was looking at things like your three nanometer squares, and there are other light spots around, and that getting into the, the aspect also. If you have something that did not go as planned, can you capture it and come out as planned? Yeah, um, actually right now we can, in, in the vernacular of sort of uh, mask making in litho, we can fix opaque defects, we can't fix currently clear defects. If I miss a hydrogen atom, I can come back and image that and remove a hydrogen atom. What currently I can't do, we have some hints of ways we might be able to do that reasonably well locally, is I can't put hydrogen back down where it's been removed. So if I make a mistake and remove a hydrogen atom I don't want to, don't want to remove, uh, then it, I don't know of a very good way right now to repair that. If I miss a hydrogen atom, I can come back and remove it. Now, th there is something that a, a number of you were polite enough not to mention, but it is in a lot of my images. Uh, uh, let me go back maybe to my, the, the first one that I come to. Yeah, right, my six pointed star. There's a lot of dangling bonds outside of that six pointed star. And uh, some of those were there beforehand, but there's a lot more after we've done it. There's a spurious depassivation, some that's happening too far away from the tip to be stray electrons. We think it's hydrogen coming back down to the surface and extracting another hydrogen, making a hydrogen molecule and making a dangling bond. Uh, we don't know that for a fact. Uh, uh, but the good news is for the vast majority of things I want to do, those single dangling bonds don't bother me. If I'm growing silicon, the, uh, the single dangling bond, the disilane won't stick to it. If I'm trying to put phosphorus atoms where I want them, the phosphine doesn't stick to the single dangling bond. They do nucleate a little bit of ALD, but it's so small an amount that we can largely ignore it. So that is a limitation that is, you could maybe, I don't think it has anything to do with entropy. Uh, maybe you could argue that. Um, uh, but, but there are some things that we're going to have to clean up if we want to get to absolute precision. 
this ultimately limits us to some extent. Uh, in this other image, you can start to see it's when we've got a lot of stuff removed and a narrow gap between it, this starts getting pretty messy in between here. And so that's something we're going to have to learn and con to control better. There's some hands up way in the back. My name is Zeynep. I'm a member of the uh, society. Actually, the question is invoked by the question you just answered. Can you control the energy of the knocked off hydrogen atoms then to maybe prevent the external atoms being, yeah, there's a, being there's broken? A lot, um, there's a lot of speculation about that. Uh, it, there's a significant possibility, and we've sort of argued this back and forth, haven't really attempted to determine it, that when the hydrogen comes off, it may be ionized. If it is ionized, I stand a real good chance of getting it where I want it to be uh, with some local fields. If it's not ionized, um, I, I do have quite a range. It's actually a, a huge parameter space that I can operate in and still get atomically precise uh, patterns. And so there may be a space in there that's, that affects the energy of the, of the liberated uh, hydrogen atom that, that would improve the ability to keep it from coming back to the surface. We're pretty sure it's bouncing off the tip, or at least the speculation is it's bouncing off the tip and coming back down. So maybe there's something that we can do to functionalize the tip to capture the hydrogen as it comes off and every once in a while shake that hydrogen off. There's a number of things we could potentially do there. It's a great question. I'm Bob. Yeah, I'm a member. Uh, could you talk about the time element of this, of how long it takes to put down an atom, and how long these patterns that you're showing here? Well, oh, this is a great question about uh, uh, patterns uh, moving. Um, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the mobility of hydrogen on silicon surfaces. And at room temperature, they just don't go anywhere. But to do this, this pattern growth of silicon that we're trying to do, we have to operate at about uh, 250 to 300 degrees C. At 300, the hydrogen starts moving around, okay? Uh, uh, but it, below that, it, if there's any motion, it's very, very subtle. Um, uh, so, uh, but at, at room temperature, uh, the patterns just don't move. There's too big an energy barrier. The, the likelihood of one moving is very, very small. So at room t temperature, very stable. There, there's tricky things that we've got to do to get better growth, to get that, the process that I really want to do to do absolute precision is going to involve operating at higher temperatures and there's going to be some trade-offs. The higher temperature I go, the more mobility I've got of the silicon atoms to make good epitaxy, but the, the greater chance that I'm moving hydrogen around in a way that I don't want to. But there does appear to be a temperature regime that we can make it work, I, I believe. And there's lots of other tricks to get the epitaxy to work we haven't tried yet. Way yeah. in the very back, a guy had his hand up for a, quite a while. Let's try to get back to him. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm David Bell. I'm a member. You, on your last slide, had a bunch of question marks as for uh, what the applications of this technology are. Do you have any sort of aspirational uh, machines or devices or, or materials that you'd like to create with this technology or that you'd like to have Zyvex create uh, in the future? Well, I, um, I definitely want, I, I think there's a huge opportunity in the, in, the, in the biomedical space. Once we can sculpt surfaces with atomic precision or absolute precision, we can start thinking about making designed molecular interactions. And that, I think, is a very exciting area to try to get into. Uh, I, I mentioned briefly uh, designed enzymes. It would be a, a really, really cool thing to do. Um, beyond that, I mean, what, I'll tell you what Jim Von Ayer would like for us to make. He would like for us to make a Drexler-like nanorobot that we can uh, produce a huge number of and, and up our speed. Um, I, I see too many problems in the short term. I don't want to go all the way to it. I just want to use standard MIMS processing to make MIMS scanners that I can make on a pretty small footprint and, and gang up as many as maybe a million of them to operate in parallel. Uh, but I want, independent, I want those independently controlled. And, and, and by the way, the way I want to do that, okay, you ask, so here's what I want to do that in part deals with this, but 
the tool I want to make to make this scale up is, um, um, and we've got a guy, Neil Sarkar, a spectacular guy, he's got a little company, he used to work for us up in Canada called Integrated Circuit Scanning Probe Instruments. He's about to release in a few months a product that's a little small scale MIMS based AFM that he's calling the, mi the microscopic microscope for the masses. Um, <laughs> and the, the opportunity here is you make a very small MIMS scanner that has the, the precision that you need, you close the loop on that with capacitive sensors or, or some other way, and you build a microcontroller to control that, put it on a bus, and, and you don't have to send in a bunch of separate control lines to any one scanner. You can have local, a local smart scanner that will be hugely easier to scale up to a large array than a bunch of separate scanners you have to reach in from the outside and control. So I think there's a huge opportunity here to use CMOS, small controllers, MIMS controllers that, that, that are smart con uh, nano positioning controllers. So that's something that I would like to put a lot of time and energy into that will really dramatically help us with this manufacturing tool. That really didn't answer your question, but I wanted to say that. Yeah, let's go gentlemen there. Paul Sheehan, uh, guest. Uh, so, John, if we, uh, to take your, your wife's side in this, who's a chemical engineer, um, so we do have a large industry in the U.S. making atomically precise uh, materials, which is the pharmaceutical industry, right? And so they make very, very complicated, you know, designs that we literally trust our lives with. Um, and so what they offer is atomically precise relative position. What you're offering is atomically precise absolute position. Uh, have you thought, I mean, do you have a, I mean, you, you've offered some examples, but can you, do you have some classes of, of objects that are better for this absolute positioning versus this relative positioning? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, complex systems, uh, uh, you need the absolute precision to build up more complex systems. Uh, uh, machines that are, that are top-down controllable, um, uh, it's, there are people that have, that have thought up ways of trying to get you know, different things floating around that communicate with photons to do computation so they don't have to be positioned exactly the, in the right place. Uh, uh, and maybe there's some great and wonderful things to do along those lines. I want to stick with a more kind of traditional approach of making things where I'm controlling both the size and the placement with as much precision as I possibly can, hopefully absolute precision it's much easier to think of things I can make that way. What you're suggesting, there's some very powerful ideas, uh, but uh, we're going to leave that for somebody else to work on. I, I don't want to go there. I, I want to stay with what I think makes sense to me. And, and maybe somebody's going to take a different approach and blow our socks off. I like this approach. Uh, the, 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 the argument that people often make is that, well, let's look at what nature does. Okay, nature does these things in these much more complex ways. They don't have, they make these absolutely beautiful little molecular machines, but they don't have absolute precision in placing them, and they still get them to work together. Well, birds fly by flapping their wings. I don't see too many airplanes flying that way. Okay, uh, nature is an inspiration, and maybe they have a better solution, but in the short term, we can, we can kind of constrain things, get better control of them, engineer them, and they work pretty well. Uh, so that's, that's, maybe I don't have enough of an imagination there. I don't know. Let's give a couple more questions. Anybody in the back? Okay, go ahead. David Rosen again. Uh, Zymvex isn't a semiconductor t uh, company. You said that the semiconductor companies aren't going to get into it because their market because they don't see a, an immediate market that's going to be profitable. So what, so what is the market Zyvex is selling towards? Well, so, so Zyvex is not a semiconductor company. I mean, we don't make semiconductors. Uh, uh, we, we make Zyvex Instruments, now part of DCG, makes tools that the semiconductor industry uses, okay? But I can't, the approach that I'm taking will not make uh, consumer uh, semiconductors, I just don't have the throughput. Okay, okay, what it'll make is things like, D 
I don't need to make but a couple of hundred DNA sequencers to make a hugely valuable tool. I don't need to make very many atomically precise uh, metrology standards to make a big impact in the rest of industry. I don't need to make very many NIMS oscillators uh, to get very high frequency control over some, uh, some operations that we want to do. Th there's already we've identified, I, I, if I can make nano imprint templates, oh God, there's just a huge number of things. Well, 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 I'm, I'm going to look for more. I'm, I'm definitely going to look. Well, my early, my early products, frankly, are going to be a few specialized nanostructures. But really, what I want to do is I want to be to nanotechnology what applied materials is to semiconductor manufacturing. I want to provide the tools. I want to provide the tools that are going to, oh, there's lots of people with lots of cool nanotechnology ideas. They don't have the manufacturing tools to make them work. I want to provide the manufacturing tools to these people and allow them to invent all sorts of cool stuff and bring it to the market. So the tool, really more than anything else, is what we're after. I want to make UHV scanning, tunneling, uh, lithography tools that have multiple tips and produce uh, structures with unprecedented precision. That's what the product that I'm most interested in. I like making tools. And one last question. Uh, David Bermuth again. Uh, another technical question. Uh, after you've removed a layer of uh, hydrogen atoms and you want to put the silane in, do you, can you do that in the same chamber as the STM without destroying the tip, or do yeah. you have to move it to a different chamber? It's a good question. I'm not sure the jury's out on that. And by the way, somebody asked me a question about how long I, that I didn't answer about the speed. Uh, let, me, let me try to answer that and answer you at the same time. R currently, we can remove about 100 hydrogen atoms a second, okay, with the low resolution, the high resolution mode. At the high biases, we can remove uh, uh, Order, orders of magnitude more than that. We can, we can do a, a square micron in a relatively short period of time, whereas with a little single tip, there's a lot of atoms in a square micron of silicon. Um, but then the question becomes, is how long can I keep that silicon clean in UHV before I need to bring in the disilane? That limits the, what I can do, because the patterning is the slow part. It takes a second or two to deliver a few Langmuirs of disilane that sticks down on the silicon, or, or whatever else uh, I'm doing, uh, depositing there. It doesn't take long at all to deposit. The length of time is patterning. So the better my vacuum, the more I can pattern before I, then I have to dump in stuff. And, and that has advantages in terms of, of doing the uh, lithography. So uh, we're, we're working to speed up primarily through this combination of big beam, small beam. I'm not going to get that much more speed. Uh, I could maybe get another order of magnitude but it's still really slow. I want to go parallel, and this MIMS-based positioning is, I think, the way to do it. Uh, so, let's see, was there anything in there that I didn't ask, that I didn't answer? Yeah, uh, um, that's a whole long story. Is the disilane sticking on the tip? I don't have any, I don't have strong evidence that that's happening. Uh, I do have annoying changes in the tip that we don't entirely understand. I frankly think that one of the principal culprits is mobile atoms on, on the surface, especially on the hydrogen passivated surface, that I can't see because they're moving, that sometimes end up between the tip and the sample and cause a, monetary, a, a momentary short and rearrange the atoms just enough to change the way the imaging and lithography is working. That's something that may or may not be true, but th there are some annoying things that we've got to clean up to get longer tip life. That's, that's a problem that has to be solved. I think we're out of question time. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a marvelous audience. Thank you so much. You can ask great questions. Thank you very much. By the way, is this an image of teleportation? What do you... Oh, I, I'm just <laughs> suggesting something Star trek -y. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much again. We have a couple of things for you this evening. One is the announcement of the lecture signed by the members of the comedian frame oh, thank you for so you to much. keep very nice and also i was intrigued by your liking belgian chocolate which i also do and also uh belgian ale so oh. give another present for you here Ooh. Uh, a little, what do we got uh some belgian ale oh here. some uh alambic cool yeah. thank you very much Quark. 1971 so 
George Washington became president. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought we don't chill it. We'll make it years later because eight and a half percent alcohol. So you know. <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.